Sarah is an amazing um, cartoonist and advocate for cartoons as well as a creative. And she has created, she's written books, she's she's an illustrator, she's written memoir, she's done strip comics, she's done the three words comic anthology. She's an absolute legend mm -hmm. and we're so excited that we got to interview her. Yeah, and that unique autobiographical content and like her uh, illustrations kind of, just like her character kind of seeps through the illustration as, as it often does. You can get a real sense of who she is just by looking at her art. Yes. And that's, I think, a key part of what she wants to do. Absolutely. Kia ora, ko Sarah Takuingua. I am Sarah Lang. I'm a cartoonist and I am also a prose writer and um, a graphic designer. And I live here in Wellington. My big foray into the comics community um, was my blog, which I made, let me be frank, which was, um, you know, I would like a diary comic essentially. And I would, uh, at first, I was very conscientious and I would update it you know four or five even six days a week with a little kind of scrappy little comics that I would write about my daily observations and funny situations I found myself in um, then I decided that I needed to write a serious comic a serious graphic novel and uh, what the kind that might get me you know a grant and uh, the kind that might get me a residency and um, so so I I uh, wrote a, a graphic memoir called Mansfield and Me um, about um, my wanting to be a writer and um, set against the life of our most famous short story writer, Catherine Mansfield. Um, and uh, yeah, I also um, helped edit an anthology of, uh, because it became, and in fact, I, I was going through some old um, things yesterday. I was going through, I've, terrible at letting go and I have to move house and I have to get rid of most of my stuff well actually not, not most of my stuff but some of my stuff and I was going through these old boxes where I've collected these stashes of magazines and I found a 1994 pavement magazine and there was an article about comics in the pavement magazine and it talked about the godfather of comics Dylan Horrocks and <laughs> Cornelia Stone and um Ant Sang and uh and and various other people Simon Morse and um and and I was like Dylan must have been in his 20s then, and he was already the godfather of comics in his 20s. Um, but, uh, but, um, but, but I think that in the, in, the, in the 2000s, when I entered the comic scene, and I think I had been kind of, you know, obviously I knew about comics in the 90s, and I was of an age that I could draw comics since I'd been drawing them since I was a small child. Um, but, but it did seem very much like a um, sort of a man's world. And, um, and I, in fact, Stella Corkery featured in that article as well. And she, had, she had, was just putting out the Daughters of Slaughter um, comic strip, um, which apparently had failed to get funding. This is all fresh in my memory because I just read the article yesterday. It failed to get... Um, it failed to get funding because it was deemed offensive because they were making some, you know, rude jokes as comics like to do. Um, and uh, but but I, you know, like in the in the two thousands, um, two thousand and when was it even? It was like two thousand and sixteen. We we published the three words, which was um, a collection of of women's comics, which was meant to be kind of an answer to the. Um, the argument that women didn't really make comics and 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 what um, the editors Indra Neville and Ray Joyce and I wanted to show was in fact women had been making comics all along they just people just hadn't been paying as much attention to them as they had been paying attention to the comics made by men uh, yeah after that um, I decided to collect together all of the um, comics that I made in my book let me be frank it wasn't although I keep on saying all the comics that I made but in fact it was not all the comics I made it was probably about quarter of the comics that I made because I really did have a bit of graphomania and I really just you know just keep drawing keep drawing it does become weirdly addictive particularly if you're making it for social media people go oh, I really like that I really like that you know I'm you know that's really funny and you know me being a kind of a terrible people pleaser and also having this sort of black hole for compliments uh, you know meant that I sort of needed to draw, draw more and more and more and uh, so I could get more and more of that little adrenaline fix of somebody going wow that's really cool that's really funny so um so 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 yeah so I actually have loads of comics which never made it into my let me be frank anthology um and uh yeah and, and sort of that you know all sorts of i think um there's been all sorts of various side projects including having a um 
a sort of a monthly comic strip for Metro magazine and um, I even actually my very first paid comic strip was for the uh, Little Treasures magazine, the Nappies magazine and I used to do little baby comic strips because um, just like really dumb things about, well, actually in fact I think I did again like I, I was censored and my favourite one was when I had a, like a little comic strip of my daughter eating too many blueberries and then like doing these giant blueberry like poos and uh, and that that was censored that was that that didn't make the cut but um but they were little kind of I think they were little kind of um, they were just like little strips of the four panels just little kind of baby gags and you know preferably with a little bit of nappies some um, placement in them um and uh and and most recently I've been doing a comic strip for um woman magazine which is um which is a monthly, but it was actually a fortnightly magazine, but it's gone back to a monthly magazine. It's just actually like a, I think it must be a really difficult time to launch a magazine in New Zealand with um, with with COVID and with people not really going to shops and with people not really consuming print media so much either. People far more kind of consuming online media, be it Netflix or Instagram comics or something like that. So, um, so that turned into monthly, and um, and now it is no more. But but I am working on another project, and my um, project which I am working on right now um, is a children's book which I am doing in collaboration with um, animal enthusiast, bird enthusiast, and uh, poet. Jo Emini, Johanna Emini, and uh, she um, and we're writing about this woman, um, Sylvia, who's a um, who, who's been a bird rescuer and rescued hundreds and thousands of birds, and uh, and you know, and also kind of young environmentalists who also um, there's a young environmentalist Charlie who also um, is you know has travelled to the archipelago of um, archipelago I never know how to say that word um, archipelago of Hawaii to, to look after the albatrosses there and to clean up the island to look after the albatrosses so so it's kind of a book about um, you know how to look after birds in your own backyard and how to um, and you know these incredible environmental heroes who are just basically volunteers who have gone and rescued you know like thousands of Penguins and hundreds of albatrosses and um, and yeah, so it's sort of both a sort of a, a story of their lives as well as um, kind of a, a guide as to how to make the world a better place for birds. Yeah, so that's kind of like a fast forward overview of the stuff that I've been working on lately and have been for the past decade. How has the process of collaboration gone between you and the writer? It has been an interesting process. I mean, in a way, I feel as though um, you are a translator of sorts um, because, um, you know, they will give, for instance, um, Jo will give me a script and um, she'll say, can you say this and can you say this? And quite often, like, the chunks of text that she wants me to say will be quite huge and I will think, no, I can't say that because that's way too much for a single panel. And and also, uh, I don't actually think that people speak that way. So um, so quite often it will be a matter of sort of breaking up the chunks of information that uh, she has given me into what I think is sort of... Um, I, I basically I translate it into the visual medium so so it's sort of like I would say definitely as a cartoonist and I have done this before this is that I have actually worked with um, with academics turning oral histories into comic strips and yeah very much it's a sort of like an adaptation it's I would imagine it's quite similar to how you might um, you know have a novel and turn it into a, a film script or something it's sort of it becomes something else yeah, I mean, you know, and of course the, the problem with, um, you know, working with somebody else is that there is quite a lot of toing and froing and lots of changes and lots of, and you know, something, and part of you is just like, ah, just, just let me do it my way, but, um, but then you kind of hope that, you know, just like Lennon and McCartney, you know, you know, like two different perspectives make things better and, uh, and hopefully it will be like a kind of a better, a better story for it because it's, you know, it's, um, it's got you know, different perspectives coming to it and, you know, like a, a sort of editorial checks and, uh, yeah. And also, I mean, like, Joe's really good at pointing out what a bad speller I am. So, yeah, yeah. I have I have trouble with that. I, I wrote um, privilege with a D-G-E and I wrote acknowledgements with a G-E. So I have trouble with, you know, those, those, those double consonants. So, uh, yeah. 
You've got the Let Me Be Frank comics and COVID diaries, which are very much kind of in the moment. And then you've got these other quite considered pieces. Do you enjoy one process more than the other? It's definitely a different way of working. It's a different way of way of working. And um, and, and in some ways I sort of, um, when I'm kind of doing the, the short diary comics, it's sort of, I mean, it's sort of in a way it's like, you give, it's, a, it's this, time of incredible constraint you sort of had to write something within a day and and with the COVID comics the COVID diary comics um I had to write something I was writing specifically for for Instagram which has um you know at the at the moment you know you can put 10 photographs in there in a single post and so I was doing a 10 panel square comic specially designed for for Instagram and just the sort of constraint of that, it's sort of like it got that same satisfaction of a, you know, Sudoku or a kind of a Wordle kind of thing. It's just like, look, I've got these got these gaps and I've got to fill them and I've got to turn it into a little story. And so it, so it has that nice, yeah, sense of, 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 of a kind of a puzzle that you're completing when, when you do it. Um, yeah, whereas, um, whereas the considered pieces very much are more like um, you, you know, you draft them and you, Sort of you consider them and you um, you revise them. So so it's sort of it's more of a long and considered process. And definitely like writing Mansfield and me, um, <clears throat> that yeah that took me a really long time. I mean it took quite a few drafts and and I sort of did it in this very old school way, which I'm no longer working in, but I kind of miss and I do want to return to. So so for instance Mansfield and me, I kind of wrote all of these notes and wrote all of these comics and I filled up all of these journals and then I sort of had. And, I, and weirdly enough, I still didn't know what the story was. Like, it wasn't obvious to me what this, I mean, I could find all of these parallels between Mansfield's life and my life, but I didn't really know what the narrative thread was going to be that that held the whole story together. But then once I figured it out, when I, once I figured out, well, actually, it's just about me wanting to be a writer and Catherine Mansfield wanting to be a writer and sort of mapping our two desires and trajectories against each other. And um, and once I figured that out, it just seemed like, you know, patently obvious and how come could have I not figured that out before? Um, but, um, you know, but, but, but I, um, so, so once I did that, I sort of, um, you know, I would draft each chapter and then I would get my nice watercolour paper and I'd carefully pencil it all up and and then I would sort of, you know, draw the pencil lines and then I would ink all the outlines and then I would, you know, watercolour them and, um, I, you know, I, I kind of liked to, like, have little fantasies of myself, like a kind of a, a Cal Mond style painter. Here I am in my studio, I'd line up about four pages and I'd get out my paint and I'd, you know, like, do all the Sarah flesh tone first and then I'd do all the the Sarah here second and uh, and so I was kind of very much I'm like here I am I'm like I was just on a production line that's the, the reason why I'm kind of like doing the whole Carl Morn thing is because you know like I'm, I'm sure that he works on more than one flower painting at a time I'm sure he kind of like lines them up and but uh <laughs> anyway um but um but this may be untrue I may just be speculating I don't actually know I'm just making shit up but uh but but um but yeah so so that so that was that was and and in a way, like when I look back at it, I kind of think, oh God, so many I worked so hard on these drawings, and still so many of them were kind of terrible and kind of messy, and you know, like I sort of didn't get the the face shapes right, and I didn't. But and and um and now I'm sort of I'm working far more on um digitally, and um with digital media it's far more tempting to go back and, you know, rub things out and redraw them. And so, so there is probably like a far more, in my recent work, which I'm now doing digitally, it is, there's probably far more of a consistency. But again, you kind of like think, well, I mean, like, am I, is there something nice about being messy and raw and having weird face shapes? Like some of them look like cherries and some of them look like potatoes. And, you know, I mean, is it like actually better to be that person who can't draw the same face twice or you know is it better to look like a proper cartoonist to I mean I guess we all like a little part of us even if we really love scrappy indie messy punk comics we also still all want to be Ashe as well I don't know maybe that's just me but you know I still I still kind of like as I'm sort of drawing my comics I'm like how did he do it how did he make Tintin look the same every time like how anal was he but uh yeah you know, it's also just like with the brush as well, um, 
you know, like if you just push just a little bit too hard, suddenly the line weight is, you know, way too thick or it's just in the wrong position. It's just kind of, the, it's remarkable the amount of precision that you need to have in order to get an accurate face shape. And, um, you know, with digital, it's just very tempting. You've got like a little lasso tool and you can just pull your line back over again. But yeah, I mean, I definitely think that there is something, something lost, but there's also something gained as well. I mean, like I find, um, you know, I sort of live a slightly peripatetic life at the moment and I um, sort of live between two houses and it's very, very easy for me to take just one iPad from one house to the next and have all of my, my entire project with me. Whereas before, I, you know, like I, you know, had all my, yeah, I had, I had this huge manuscript and I had all these books and I had sort of like paint set up and a big table and, um, and, and that was not so transportable. So, so for my, for my life at the moment, this digital, this small kind of streamlined digital way of working really suits me. So, uh, yeah. Can I ask a question around the tools that you use with the iPad? Um, I'm just using Procreate, yeah, yeah. Do you have a brush that you particularly yeah. like? Yeah, I sort of, um, I sort of settled on, um, I've got like about three brushes that I particularly like to use, and one of them is um, the dry ink one. Um, I use that for the outlines of the drawings. Um, and then I, um, and then I'll just, a studio brush I find quite useful, like just for colouring, you know how you sort of like, you do a little swirl and then you pull the colour in and it fills up the colour, so that, so that's useful because it sort of seals a little kind of colour box for you, um, but then after I've gone and put all of the base colours on, then I will, um, try and mess everything up by getting a, a wet acrylic brush and I'll sort of like kind of swish all over it just to give it a little bit more of a, that a young, ununiform look about it. I mean, I think I probably probably still um I still work r really quickly so 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 there is still I would hope I like to think there is still kind of a, a looseness and an immediacy to my um drawings or kind of a roughness and, and probably there is still a, like a great inconsistency because I just think that I'm just one of those people inconsistent and um so so um so but but yeah it's definitely definitely yeah kind of a more streamlined process. Memoir and autobio or diary comics, I feel like that's a home place for you in some ways. Is is that something that feels true to you? Yeah, I mean I definitely feel very comfortable in the autobio space. Um, I mean I did, I have tried to write um, non-autobiographical comics and I did actually do a children's manuscript um, which I have never finished it's still it's all on paper it's all on paper and it's all done in ink um, with brushes um, this is pre-digital Sarah um, although yeah um, but um, but I think probably very much because I just started with the whole diary comic thing that's where I yeah most most comfortable uh, when I was I think when I was first starting out um, well, first, firstly, when I first started out, I was reading, um, first started out drawing comics again after a long hiatus, I was reading Persepolis, um, which I probably often say whenever anybody asks me about comics, and, and because that was a sort of, a, it was a sort of a memoir thing, I thought, oh, that's a really cool, this is a really cool format to tell personal stories in, and I mean, I had, before that I had been writing lots of short stories and I generally found, I mean, like with some exceptions, that the ones that were based quite closely on my life, the sort of autofiction, semi-autobiographical ones, were the ones that people seemed to respond to the most or the ones that I found the easiest to write and that had the most energy. And so in a way I kind of feel like, yeah, personal stories are often where I sort of have the most to say even though my life is not particularly interesting, but um, but it just seems to be where I'm most, most comfortable writing. You say your life is not interesting, but I don't know that that's true because lots of people are very interested. Your comics manage to capture a really relatability that people feel reflected in and seen by. I don't know if that's like, that's not a question. Yeah, 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 <laughs> it's yeah. Like... oh no, but it's, it is a, a lovely thing to say. And um, yeah, um, yeah, but I, I mean, I sort of, um, Maybe it's just that other people's lives are fascinating. Haven't we all discovered that as we sort of like, you know, again, endlessly scroll through social media that, that people's, all these little lives that you get given glimpses and windows and are weirdly fascinating just to see how people around you live and how same it is, 
how similar it is in some ways and how different it is and in other ways but you know we're all just kind of yeah obsessed by the soap opera of other people's lives maybe yeah but but yes but but back to the whole memoir thing um you know i, I you know like I, I think also um just sort of like looking at um used to read a lot of gabriel i still do actually i still i'm still a patreon subscriber but i used to read a lot of gabriel bell's um, comics as well and she wrote quite a lot about her own life I mean, and the, quite wonderfully she would kind of slip into these sort of surrealist little kind of cul-de-sacs as well so it was about her life and it was also about these kind of huge bears that stumbled into her life or these kind of strange monsters or so you know it was very familiar and then very strange as as well um, which was really fascinating and and in a way like I you know I've been following her comics for years now probably like 15 years and 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 very little has changed. I mean, she's still completely anxious. You know, she still spends a lot of time doing meditation and yoga. Um, she still lives, you know, I'm not actually, I kind of think, I'm not quite entirely certain, but it seemed that she used to live in an apartment next door to a guy called Tony. And now Tony seems to live in her apartment. But I may be wrong. And maybe I may have just, you know, got this wrong. But, um, but, but it is sort of like weird how the, yeah, the banality of somebody rather else's life and, and also the way that it sort of keeps on circling back to the same themes and the same obsessions, um, you know, it's sort of uh, very, very comforting and, yeah. I mean, I have to say that I, I do not read them nearly as religiously as I used to. I used to read every single one of them, but now I'm just like, yeah, and I think perhaps my attention is not quite so, quite so good, but... Yeah, but but again, I, I think also um, you were talking about um, Hilary Shute and uh, what was the quote that you had? It was something to do with... Um... She talks about, um, yeah, graphic women. She says, comic lends itself to memoir in a really natural way because they're being drawn and written from an embodied perspective. Yeah, yes. Yeah, and I, I mean, I guess that is that that sense that you are very much, you know, you're not typing something, you are drawing something with your hand, and just even kind of your own handwriting sort of reveals something about your personality, and um, yeah, and and just um, yeah, the, the fact that you know you have to sort of this whole kind of quite physical action in order to draw things, sort of insist that I mean, you're sort of telling a story about yourself already. You're revealing something about yourself already so um if not your the actual details of your life then the things that occupy your mind your obsessions and you know the way that you know you see the world and yeah i think it's good you've had this comics project over lockdown yeah me too it's given me a focus something to do each day otherwise i might have floundered i miss you I am so sick of this level four state. I miss you too. I mean, it's been a great time for me to work on my music. I've always wanted this time, but it's been lonely. So I've got this thing to do. Tell me, why do you think art matters? Better angle, right? Less wrinkles. Huh, um, because otherwise there'd only be sport. And he can't even play sport under level four. I'm gonna ask my writing group. My arm is getting sore. What, isn't my answer enough? Crowdsourcing time. Why does art matter? Give me your answer and I'll draw a cartoon of you. Elizabeth Knox. Art remembers what we forget when we leave our bodies. Art is inherited feeling and understanding. Susan Pierce. Art reminds us of what we've forgotten we already know and of how we've always known even if we never realised it. Cool. Thank you, Susan. I'm going to ask my mum. Robin Lang. Visual artists make us look at our surroundings and the other from new perspective. Things that we barely perceive can become transfixing. Art matters because... Art matters because... Because you like drawing? I guess so. I like ordering things into little boxes so I know how I feel about life. I wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about your experience as using comics or using writing as a way to not only self-express but self-discover. Yes, I sort of, uh, you know, want to write because I have questions about things and I want to figure out how I feel about them and and very much, um, yeah, writing is a way that I can is a way that I can figure out how I, I feel about things and also writing is a way that I can figure out 
what the story is and sometimes I think that when I'm not in that the very you know people talk about the flow and they talk about you know sort of process and, and that kind of thing and I, so I quite often feel as though I'm not actually going to think properly about something until I'm actually kind of trying to write it down or I'm trying to draw it or I'm trying to articulate it so so before I come to a comic then um or if I before I lately I've been writing essays and before I come to an essay I'll sort of have these or a comic I'll just have these very vague ideas that you know I just want to write something um that includes this idea or that um you know brings this particular image to light and um and then I'll draw it and then I'll think well what do I have to draw next and what do I draw next and what do I draw next and then by the time I've got to the end of the comic I'm like oh this is sort of ended up in a direction that I wasn't anticipating like I did not plan for this comic to come out this way but somehow it has and somehow it seems to work and well if it doesn't work then I guess you know the next comic might, might work so so um so yeah I mean I definitely think that for me um doing making is a sort of a, a way of of uh you know forcing myself to you know figure out how I think about something and, and also I feel as though there's sort of um you know quite a lot of um the 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 drawing the act of drawing that um sort of liberates the subconscious and kind of allows it to suggest um solutions to things that you know might not have been obvious when um you know, you initially think, oh, I'm going to draw this comic and it's going to be about this. And then suddenly your your subconscious goes and throws up a sea monster or, you know, some random character or, or something like that. So One of my favourite words is autobiofictionalography, which Linda Barry talks mm. about. And kind of, you know, the, the act of crafting comics creates a fiction as you're making sense of things. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. And I mean, and sometimes you do kind of like have to... Um, alter things slightly in order to to tell a story like and even if even if um sort of like the whole kind of notion of truthiness and so this is essentially the truth but if you you know were to kind of like you know put me in a police uh, you know kind of questioning what do they call those place interview room interview room and uh, you know to ask you is that exactly what happened you you have to say well actually it's not exactly what happened but um but in order to tell the story, this is what happened in order to serve the story that I am telling. And yeah, yes. And so, and there is, I mean, there is a sort of a, yeah, a kind of a fictionalization. There is a sort of an enhancing of certain details and dramatizing of other details. And yeah, so, so definitely it's sort of, I mean, like once it goes down on paper, it's, yeah, kind of a creative interpretation of events. Your life is quite full. You've got a graphic design job, you're doing animations, you're making zines, you're writing a book, you're also doing the odd comic. How do you juggle all of the things? I mean I don't, I feel as though I do less things now and in fact when I was younger um, I did way more things um, and um, you know like I had three young children and I was like I kind of sometimes look at my photographs and I think who was that person? Who was she? I don't know her anymore. I'm just like now a tired old tired old woman lying on the sofa and watching another movie I mean god yeah but but uh, but you know like I was like used to make all these little craft projects and uh, anyway write novels and look after children and and I seem to have loads of energy and I and I don't have quite as much energy now and um and so and, and I don't think I'm doing nearly as many things um which I think is fine I think that there is sort of an obsession with productivity which sort of is wrapped up in an anxiety for me I think you know, for me, I think the anxiety was that, you know, if I was a very shy child and, you know, like I always felt like an outsider and kind of like socially not cool. And, and, and so, so in a way making, making work was like, here I am, I'm here, I'm here in the world. Look at me, look at me, you know, like I, I so, 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 I mean, as well as the fact that I really liked writing, but, but, but I do feel as though there was sort of an, there was an anxiety of, productivity in which I felt like I had to constantly be making things and proving my worth and being validated and and so um so so <clears throat> so I'm sort of trying to do less things but also but also there is the other complication that actually making things makes me feel really good so um so so my my tactic at the moment is that I um I very much yeah I think I might have said before just chip away at things yes. and it, and it, it has always been quite a good method for me I mean I have had street stretches where I can concentrate solely on my art and they've been really fantastic and I do really want to have another one of those stretches but 
but I also find that if you just sort of like, yeah, just keep on keeping on, then like you'll look back after a year or so and go, wow, actually I did make quite a few things, even though it felt like I was doing hardly anything, I did actually make quite a few things and yeah. And then again, you know, like it's that sort of like, well, if you're not being productive, like why should you have to be productive and don't beat yourself up for it because, yeah, exactly what are you being productive for? I mean, like how do you get started in comics and how do you keep going in comics as well? I mean, I guess you have to think, well, I mean, what are the, you've got to write something that you'd be interested in reading. What, what are the kind of things that you like reading that's the kind of territory that I think you should probably explore? And, oh, I mean, I guess also the other thing is like, what are you, why are you wanting to draw comics? Are you wanting to draw comics because you're a really amazing drawer? Or are you wanting to draw comics because you want to find community? Or are you wanting to draw comics because... Um, you just want to have something to do. Um, I mean, I think that comics is like an incredibly, like, like uh, you know, forgiving medium as well. So, so I mean, I often tell people that I mean, you don't you don't need to actually have to be able to draw particularly well to be a cartoonist. You can like be a real shit drawer, but you can have like good jokes or you know, interesting things to say. Yeah, I would say also read a lot of comics. That's I always think reading is where um, you know that's where you kind of read things that inspire you. And and for me as well. Drawing comics is very much about having conversation with other cartoonists that I like, and um, and yeah, just in my little Facebook memories, uh, just about two days ago, popped up me totally gushing over Alison Bechtel and draw and showing her a cartoon strip I drew of her, of me and her meeting. It was all very meta, and so 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 yeah, I think yeah, look look to the people that you admire, and um, and I think there's no shame in sort of like trying to copy them, and when you're learning as well, I don't. There's no shame in trying to copy when you're learning. Um, and, you know, if you like the way that Alison Bechtel draws eyes, then draw eyes like that. Or if you like the way that Dylan Horrocks draws eyes or Toby Morris draws eyes, then draw eyes like that. You know, I mean, like, eyes eyes are really hard. I still haven't figured out how to draw eyes. I'm still like, how do I draw eyes? Uh, and I would also say that um, it is nice for me. For me, um, when I first started drawing out, I didn't show anybody. I first started out, I didn't show anybody. I just kept my own little journal. And, and that was sort of fun for developing my style um, but again sort of those mediums I, I mean I keep on coming back to Instagram I mean like if you if you want to start showing some people some comics then you can start up you can do the whole kind of Instagram thing and that's the way I consume lots of comics these days I sort of you know scroll through and read lots of people and in fact half of my feed is filled with cartoonists and so every day I'm you know reading these little tiny little comic strips and um, it's sort of a, I think it's like a nice nice medium for sharing your work and getting some feedback and um, yeah but then again you know as I said before you don't want to get into this crazy loop of feeling as though you're just drawing for an audience I mean remember you're drawing for yourself you're drawing because you like drawing and you've got a story that you you want to tell or you want to figure out how to tell a story yeah and um, and then and also my final tip would be I think somebody recently said to me um said to me, oh, I can't, I don't want to share any comics because I, I don't know what my style is. I haven't developed my style yet. And um, I, I mean, I would think, again, like just not to overthink it. I think that just, if, just by drawing, you will find your voice and your style. So, yeah. I was wondering if you could tell people where to go to find your comics. You can go to a bookshop. Um, you can go to a, a local bookshop. Um, a VUP have um, published my last two books, Mansfield and Me, and um, Let Me Be Frank, and I've been included in a couple of recent um, anthologies, including Out There and Locked Down, and um, and then you can also um, find it on my blog, which I have not updated for a couple of years, but it's um, sarahelang.com, and also on my Instagram feed, and my handle there is Sarah E. Lang. Yeah, and you can come to the library and get my books out and some of my zines out as well. So, yeah. Hooray. Yay. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really lovely.